Hello, and welcome to the Mohit Show. In this video I will be covering stories from r slash dtrans, a well-moderated subreddit for people questioning, desisting, or detransitioning. I will be protecting the identities of these posters since individuals in this community have been harassed when their stories have been discussed. A text-to-speech voice is being used due to current recording difficulties. Don't worry, I will be able to voice again soon. This video's first post, titled, I underwent gender transition surgery, here's what the media doesn't tell you post copied from article in description and posted to r slash dtrans. I awoke confused. Where was I? What happened, and why was I lying on the bathroom floor soaked in urine mixed with blood? As I wiped the urine from the inside of my legs, I reached for something to help me to my feet, still unaware of where I was. Too weak to stand alone, I leaned forward onto the countertop for stability and looked into the mirror. Who was this middle-aged man staring back at me? Where was Kelly? Where did I go? What had I become? I felt Kelly on the inside, but within a matter of months, who I was was gone. Shaking my head to alleviate the pain and disorientation I was experiencing, it all flashed back. I turned to the toilet. I was there. I had passed out again from the pain of having six inches of bacteria-infected hair on the inside of my urethra. This time, the infection was so severe that I had a silicon tube placed in my arm to deliver four antibiotics. Every morning I awoke to the pain. It took everything I had to get dressed for work, hobble to my car, enter the hospital, and receive my four antibiotics. Survival itself became a struggle. Just 15 months prior, I had undergone a phalloplasty, a female-to-male bottom surgery in which doctors created a fallow using skin harvested from the arms and legs. This marked the sixth surgery I'd undergone within two years. It was the most traumatic of them all, and I'd begun to endure the crippling pain associated with the side effects of a surgery I was told would be routine. Yet, despite the dangers of such serious medical procedures, surgeons who enter the field of transgender surgery need little to no specialized training. Doctors looking to expand their horizons can essentially make a trip to the local office max and have a sign made saying, transgender surgeon, hang it on the door, and, poof. The transgender craze will supply them with a line of patients begging for surgery. Instantly, they have insurance companies approving $50,000 procedures with profit margins mirroring brain surgery, no questions asked. These surgeons have the LGBTQ force shield to protect them from any criticism as well as an army of activists to rationalize any negative publicity as transphobia. These unqualified surgeons hide behind LGBTQ ideology to dodge medical malpractice cases because transgender surgery is considered experimental, and without a set baseline to compare results, lawsuits are almost impossible. Many top-rated surgeons in the world refuse to conduct transgender bottom surgeries, not because of bigotry, but because they know the risks associated with an elective surgery marred by an incredibly high complication rate. However, for surgeons accustomed to making $300,000 a year for appendectomies and other less complicated procedures, the allure of increasing their salary instantly by performing gender affirmation surgeries can often be impossible to resist. And as I experienced, many of the doctors taking part in these surgeries are content to ignore the complications associated with them as long as the money keeps coming in. The complications associated with my surgery have rewritten the date on my tombstone. I have shortened my life with this decision, and I think about my future grandchildren every day, knowing I may never meet them. I ache for them, and in my head I'm constantly saying, I'm sorry my babies and future grandbabies. I'm so, so sorry. I remember the indoctrination and the unease as I began the surgery roller coasters, and when looking back, embarrassment falls upon me. How could I have been so stupid at 42 years old? As I deal with and try to recover from PTSD, I can still vividly recall the start of it all. My eyes felt heavy, but the bright white walls of the surgery clinic kept me alert as the four drugs started to take the edge off. You'll be fine, my fiancé Lynette said, but something inside me told me differently. Something inside me screamed at me to leap off the gurney as the nurse began to unlock my hospital bed to wheel me into the operating room. Lynette could see I was anxious and squeezed my hand harder. The gesture comforted me, but deep down, I felt troubled that she was so eager to see me wheeled into the surgery room. I wished I had more time to talk to her, but instead it was all a whirlwind. I wanted to tell her my fears, but instead, I smiled at her, hoping that at any moment she would say, Baby, I know you are doing this for me, and you don't have to because I will love you anyway, just the way you are. Minutes seemed like hours as the terror grew inside me. Until all at once it hit me, and I tried to lift my body to protest and say, stop, this is wrong. But it was too late. Neither Lynette nor I said anything. By the time I came to my senses, the drugs had taken over. 
The last thing I felt was the piercing cold of the metal operating table as the anesthesiologist said, count down from 100, sir. I attempted to muster enough strength to say, wait, I'm not a sir. This is wrong. But all I emitted was the inaudible flicker of my eyelids fighting to stay awake, as my mind raced. I wanted them to stop, then it all faded to black. At the time of the surgery, it had been only two and a half months since I started taking testosterone shots, but a transformation had already begun taking place. Almost instantly, my usual self-assurance one of the critical components that made me an ultra-successful business sales executive was slipping from me. I wondered why. My confidence and cocky ear made people look up when I spoke at a sales presentation, I commanded attention. It was my sincerity, though, that made me different. My decline in confidence started almost immediately after my first injection of testosterone, and it took several months to realize that I had stepped back in conversations. In sales meetings, I stopped raising my hand, inquiring about strategies, and fighting for accounts, I wanted to get in and out without too much noise. That was not who I was, and it confused me. The reality was that, even though I had dreamed of having been born a male, thinking of how much easier my life would have been, I was not a male. Throughout my life, I dug deep, trying to develop a fondness for who I was, and it took a long time to begin the process of accepting myself. I dreamed of being the ultra boy my father wanted, the king in our family who would have had it all. I would have been the alpha male placed upon a pedestal decorated with footballs, motorcycles, money, attention, dirt, and everything else I loved. Instead, who I really was became accepted, not celebrated, and I was painfully aware of that. I worked hard over the years, though, but despite finally starting to embrace my uniqueness, I was unable to resist the fantasy of what I was told medical transition could accomplish. The complications and hurdles were schemed over, and my embrace of what I thought was self-acceptance was not established enough to fight the dream I had played in my mind constantly as a child. The idea of fitting into a puzzle that I felt was always denied to me was something I couldn't shake. At 42, when the medical industry told me I could be born again, male, I believed them. Within two and a half months of testosterone treatment, pronouns were changing, people at work started to stare, and I was painfully aware. I began doubting myself and felt held back. I wanted to talk to Lynette, but she wrapped herself up in what my transition did for us as a couple, which supposedly fixed everything on paper. There was also nothing available to help me, on the internet, in books, or in YouTube videos, that detailed the emotional side of transitioning. Only joyful transgender people who'd been magically transformed could be found. I was surprised at how quickly I was able to push the transition process along, considering the fact that I had only been on testosterone for a short period of time. It didn't seem to matter to the medical professionals, they were all too eager to continue with the procedures and swipe the credit card. The happy, light-hearted salesmanship of medical transition and its blunt reality don't match up. Doctors and medical transition proponents don't prepare you for transition-related post-traumatic stress disorders, they don't mention post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, or any of the multiple hardships because it is considered transphobic. I want to tell my story so that others can hear what the medical industry is too afraid to say out loud, that gender transition surgery is not the magical solution that doctors, the media, and culture describe. I learned from this experience that human beings can be convinced of anything if rendered at the right time, the right way, and by the right people, and I am no exception. Now, I want to protect others from the same lies that I fell for. Because the truth is worth it. Scott Nugent is an author, activist, and founder of Teary Voices, which advocates for the end of childhood gender transitioning. From the comments. Detrans and female you can read quite a few similar stories on the fallow and metoidioplasty subreddits. It's a good thing that people are finally talking. Also, we all owe gratitude to Caden Carter who was the first to fully blog his story of medical abuse. People need to know how many drawbacks and lifelong challenges come with successful fallow and meta. They need to know how devastating a failed or complicated one can be. At this point, it's not informed consent for many patients. There's some peer-to-peer -peer education that is crucial, thanks to the recent openness of past patients, and the trans community's lukewarm tolerance for their voices. It still has a ways to go. There's still many people who start down the path with no real sense of what impact it can have when it goes wrong. We've got young people who volunteered their bodies for an untested abdominal surgery by a surgeon, Cetralo, who promised them four or five stages. He'd never completed his experimental protocol on any patient, however. Somehow his patients didn't know that going in. Somehow. Informed consent, though. A couple of these patients have had eight major, full anesthesia procedures to date still with no end in sight. Other surgeons can't even help the patients Cetralo misled and failed. 
They've no idea what he did and what he was trying to do. A couple of these patients post for sympathy, then erase their posts once they've gotten their cost setting, leaving young and vulnerable prospective patients with no warning. Long way to go, but at least some light is being shown. It's currently so bad though, that we're close to, or we've reached, an intensity of issues that this industry may be shut down. I think there's a good chance that insurance will kill coverage for all if not for fallow and meta outright. Cetralo got shut down. That's something. Too late for too many people though. This is happening because no one cares what's done to dysphoric and trans-identified female people. That is, no one in authority or influence in medicine. Some of these trans-identified patients don't even care about each other they're minimizing the problems to sell others on the surgeries, and protect their surgeons. They're silencing the people who inform, caution, and honestly advise others. Stockholm Syndrome with some, misery loves company with others, denial with others. Against that backdrop, every honest voice is heroic and saving lives? D-trans female I'm curious about Caden, is there an article of some sort out there? D-trans female he blogged on Tumblr. He nearly died as a result of a punctured bowel that was leaking feces into his fallow, out through his all. His surgeon, Crane, didn't test his discharge or take Caden's fear and physical symptoms seriously. Caden got septic and necrotic, had many surgeries and a colostomy for a long time. I think he lost a good part of the phallus, if not all. He needed muscle harvested from his thigh in an effort to fill in the hole that had once been his pelvic floor. He was strong and brave. He survived after much suffering for himself, his mother, and his partner. He got a settlement from Crane which I assume barely covered his medical debt and some small part of future care. As a result, he signed a non-disclosure. I fully respect that, as it was a survival move. Some of his Tumblr blog may still survive, archived in some form. Not sure. He was a divisive figure in the trans community with many demonizing and shaming him even as he clung to life. Horrible thing to witness. Turning point in my understanding that, it's a cult. Caden was on track for medical school, if I recall right, before Crane got to him. Desisted female sadly I don't think this will be over for another 30 years. I think it's gonna take these young adults growing up and reaching their 40s and 50s to realize these devastating effects, and the children being put on puberty blockers to become adults and rebel against the BS their parents put them through because of something they said as a child. Right now the children are in their single digit years, minimum 10 years before they can possibly break out of the Munchausen syndrome of their parents and start speaking out. Desisted it really is astonishing how much the affirmation from your friends and partners can drive you along. I'm lucky my boyfriend at the time opposed my transition. If he'd have been as be your best self as my ex before, I probably would have started hormones. Desisted female Jesus that was hard to read. Those doctors need to be sued for malpractice and have their licenses revoked. As things are right now, medically transitioning should be illegal simply because there is almost no truly informed consent for these procedures. Medical professionals and trans activists are lying to people and giving them false expectations of SRS. I will support a person's decision to transition when as a society, we get to a point where patients are no longer kept in the dark about the real risks of these procedures, and when they are told the truth about what surgery and hormones can give them. The last thing I felt was the piercing cold of the metal operating table as the anesthesiologist said, countdown from 100, sir. I attempted to muster enough strength to say, wait, I'm not a sir. This is wrong. But all I emitted was the inaudible flicker of my eyelids fighting to stay awake, as my mind raced. I wanted them to stop, then it all faded to black. That was especially painful to see. Next post, titled, My Story. D trans male I guess the groundwork to my transition was laid when he was a teenager. Growing up I dealt with a huge amount of bullying as entered middle school and found myself attracted to girls I dealt with an enormous amount of rejection from them I was just viewed as the friend I started looking at other guys and thought to myself wow why can't I be like that what does she see in them that a girl can't see in me as high school went by and rejections piled up I started to think to myself maybe it's just me maybe I am just ugly and repulsive maybe no girl will ever truly want me and started to become okay with that by the time I was 16 years old I was addicted to pornography and started viewing that as a substitute for intimacy but my road to E kicked into high gear shortly after I turned 19 I found the sissy fetish on reddit and I started to resonate with it I started buying skimpy outfits and posting them on reddit and soon my inbox was flooded with messages from guys I thought to myself to the first time in my life somebody found me attractive I started thinking to myself maybe I was never meant to be a guy maybe I truly was a failure as a man fast forward to my 21st birthday I met with an androcnologist and gave them my backstory I always felt like a woman and this and that and a month later I was on estrogen my 
Intention was clear I wanted to erase the fact I was ever born male I wanted to become a completely new and different person but over the next three years I was more miserable than ever before every time I looked in the mirror I did not see the beautiful woman I thought I would become I never passed I never felt good in anything I just felt like this nobody would ever hit on me or make a move on me I felt more ugly and disgusting than ever before yet I pressed on I started going on my consults for bottom surgery I was still determined to scrub away any and all evidence that I had ever been born male but shortly after I turned 24 years old everything changed I started having these nightmares about the future one nightmare showed me as this old frail woman I was like 90 years old in a nursing home never married never had children just old and alone I started to wonder was that my fate all along but as the months raged on I started looking through my old pics and realized wow I actually was kind of handsome and from then on the dreams got better I started seeing myself falling in love getting married and having kids and from then on I started to have hope again hope that I did not have to live as a woman and realized everything I believed in was a lie I thought I was a woman trapped in a man's body I was told transitioning would set me free but instead it became another prison. I am officially a few weeks off estrogen and my body has started to recover I am growing facial hair again my breasts are starting to go away I have cut my hair now I am more confident about my masculinity than I have ever been in my entire life. Next post, titled Interesting thing I saw on slash LGBT slash questioning own gender transition what if gender dysphoria was just the brain building tolerance to the dopamine slash hormone rush from cross dressing slash transitioning? Similar to how drug addicts get withdrawals after a certain period of time, and then need to get their fix to feel normal again, gender dysphoria is the brain experiencing withdrawals from the euphoric feeling of being perceived as the opposite sex, and going too long without that psychological affirmation of seeing yourself in the image that you desire produces dysphoria. Hence, the fix is to live as a transgender 24-7, which would be akin to giving drug addicts the opportunity to live under the influence of meth slash heroin slash benzo slash alcohol slash etc. 24-7. I remember someone on here a while ago said that they felt better about being a male once they stopped cross-dressing completely and stuff. As crazy as it sounds I think I am in a similar situation now. I started noticing I was trans at 10, but really didn't feel like I was a woman. I was just interested in wearing a girl's clothes. Every Friday after school I used to ask my sister to help dress me up, and became a reoccurring thing that went on for a few years. One day I got over that phase of my life, but it wouldn't go away, and at that time I thought it was harmless, I wasn't hurting myself. Somehow I stopped, decided to play sports, my body has somewhat masculinized a lot more, though I still look decently andro since I'm 16, and started hating my body. I hated that I was tall, I started to really hate my facial structure and stuff. Cross-dressing can also trigger dysphoria by oh no I look way too much like my agab and then you realize you hate being the way you are and want to look like another. That's my personal experience. I never felt dysphoric before cross-dressing, and now lost. From the comments, D-trans male please keep in mind that the autogynophilia narrative describes a subset of men who want to be women, itself a subset of people who want to be a different gender. It's not universal questioning own gender transition why would bring perceived as the opposite sex slash non-binary create a dopamine rush in the first place? Original poster majority of acts have it including me. The fetish also is basically trying to pass as a woman. If I look like an attractive woman, then my AGP fantasies skyrocket. It's like every act's dream to be an attractive woman, most acts even have fake scenarios in their heads of looking like the perfect woman. Desisted female that's what's so off-putting and offensive to me regarding AGP, is that acts don't want to be women they want to be the patriarchal fantasy of a woman, an anime girl, a bimbo, a porn star. Dash original poster I'm guessing because around 50% of young straight males find those incredibly attractive. Most young males now unironically find anime girls attractive and wish they were real. Same thing with bimbos, the hyper effeminate, lots of pink, big lips, big breasts. Young guys also find porn stars attractive too, go to any of their followings and it's mainly young men. But acts literally wish they were them, instead of just being attracted to them normally. It is just a fetish anyways, all I can do is to abstain from any pornography, which completely diminishes any of my AGP feelings, and then I am attracted to women normally. Also most men are attracted to femininity, and not women. That's why most straight guys are attracted to femboys, twinks and sissies. Desisted female yeah I can see that. Our brain are complex. When we engage in repetitive behaviors with the addition of a sexual element the action response will be stronger. It can lead to our reward centers creating more neural pathways based on those actions. Avoiding the same sensory stimulation that created the behavior could help to minimize the desire, but there's also the aspect that adults are entitled to live and seek out pleasure with other consenting adults and not be pathologized for it. Next post, titled, What Could Have Been? The trans male I can't help but wonder what I would have looked like if I didn't start HRT at age 16. Just thinking about how I potentially stunted my growth makes me furious. I lost all of my chiseled, 
handsome features after being on HRT for so long and now I'm stuck with a shiny, puffy baby face and can't grow a beard. I'm stuck with almost C-cup breasts and, TMI, the shrinkage has not gone away. I have never felt more uncomfortable in my own body than now and I doubt that will ever change. I feel completely emasculated as a man and it's causing me to have very dark thoughts. I don't know how much more I can take. I feel like I had an opportunity to live a normal life and I blew it. Fuck Big Pharma, activists and all of the professionals involved in this harmful scam. You'll get what's coming to you. From the comments. Detrans male sad, very sad story. But there is a piece of good news. Since you have your genitalia not removed, there are some ways to finish your male puberty eventually and get your body shaped as a male. Detrans male you were pushed. You didn't blow it. You should never have been put in that position at such a young age. I understand your anger. Even with my short-term exposure to estrogen I am angry every single day over what happened to me. You have every right to be angry. I'm trying to keep reminding myself that even if I don't know if my body will ever be comfortable again it's likely that time will help me get better at emotionally handling it, at least. Next post, titled, TW, Talks of Assault. Young Girls and Self-Hatred, My Personal Thoughts and Life. Detrans Genuine Question, How Many of You Are FTM Detrans? I've been noticing an alarming pattern concerning young women transitioning and then detransitioning as of late. I myself was 100% convinced I was a man, I was speaking with doctors trying to get the surgeries covered by insurance and all that. Luckily I realized I was wrong before I made a tragic mistake many were not lucky enough to avoid. I went to high school with many of these people, and it seems the second we all left high school, we were all changing our minds and going back to womanhood, some with irreversible changes. Some of these people I still speak with. For me personally, I've always been slightly masculine with my mannerisms and interests which set a baseline starting point for the spiral. When I began to hit puberty, I was upset. Now looking back, of course I was upset. I was 11 years old being sexualized by my peers, and even grown men whether as a creepy comment or catcalling. It simply got worse and worse over time, I feel like most women can relate to that societal pressure to look desirable at all times, starting from a sad young age. The real tipping point for me was being bullied for my looks and eventually being assaulted as a young teenager, I felt disgusting and no amount of showers made me feel clean. I hated my body, I hated being a weak woman and I hated everything related to womanhood. So, I thought being a man was the way to go. It was an extreme case of self-hatred, body dysmorphia I'm not like other girls syndrome taken to the extreme. I didn't feel like what I was told a woman should be, so therefore I wasn't a woman. So back to my main point that's gotten me called a turf time and time again. I am happy for trans people who transitioned and it helped them so that's not the case, this is a separate entity. I'm sure there's plenty of MTFD trans but like I said, it's been mostly FTM from what I have seen. I'm wondering how many of you detransitioned because of this disconnect from womanhood, body dysmorphia and feeling less than as a woman. I feel like the amount of women I know personally who detransitioned is too astonishing for it to be a coincidence, there has to be a societal issue we are overlooking among adolescent females. I also have to note that a good chunk of these women have later been diagnosed with BPD, autism or some other condition, including myself being borderline with identity issues being a prevalent symptom. Sorry if this isn't well though out, it's an emotional topic and I have never been able to talk about this without being labeled a bigot. From the comments, D-trans female yes. I have too much PTSD to be able to write about this well. I enjoyed Schreer's irreversible damage, but I don't think that it went into abuse as much as needed. Transgenderism is offering one great societal bypass. We can collectively dissociate. What bothers me most are the liberals, I'm a liberal, who think that they are oh so compassionate by accepting everything on the trans activist agenda, because that is far easier to do. It's far easier than to deal with the fact that our society is so screwed up, and young people are so desperate because there is so little integrity. My mentor spoke out for young women and girls and got cancelled. She is the bravest, most loving person that I know. The trans female yes to all this but on a tangent I feel that borderline is the new hysteria. Every single person I know, myself included, with cluster B traits was brutally raped before they hit double digits. I think it's just a way to say hey you have CPTSD, but you're like extra annoying about it. I honestly think what we're missing here is that childhood abuse, especially sexual assault, is a endemic in developed countries and b damages the brain severely with the male slash female society dynamic it happens more often to women but i've met several men who seem to have the same patterns in them as i've walked back to reality from transitioning i noticed it was a shockingly far distance 
It takes a decade or two of subtle abuse and invalidation to be twisted so far you'll do anything for love, safety, acceptance, and validation like the trans community seems to offer at first. I read a really eloquent post that asserted that women who internalize their inability to live up to a feminine archetype are easing the burden on a sexist society at the cost of transitioning. I think this theory is expandable to all genders, we live in an abusive society and any person can internalize their inability to thrive in it. But then add the fact that getting sexually assaulted seems to be a rite of passage for women you're going to see more FTMTF. Original poster it's interesting to see how most of us, if not all, come from an abusive background. I really wish this is something I could openly study without potentially losing my spot in university for entertaining bigotry. Also. You just opened an off-topic can of worms I'm sorry for the incoming angry rant but I am very passionate about the BPD shit show sorry oops unfortunately I am a textbook cluster B basket case and showed signs long before I was assaulted, petulant pedal to the metal type in the most literal sense. But yet it definitely has been overdiagnosed in young girls who show more signs of CPTSD, or even autism since it presents differently in girls for some reason and I guess meltdowns can look like BPD to the untrained eye. Modern day hysteria as you put it? A lot of the women I talk to with newly diagnosed BPD express being a quiet borderline which to me sounds exactly like CPTSD and not BPD. BPD is not quiet. Cluster B has never been quiet LMFAO. It is not a quiet thing, Cluster B is literally described as dramatic, overly emotional, or unpredictable thinking or behavior. The type of behavior that ends in an ambulance or cop car ride. If you have a cluster B disorder then it's usually painfully obvious that something is wrong to the people around you, and the sufferer may be oblivious and believe everyone else is the problem. I mean, not trying to undermine CPTSD suffering but it's just, not even close when you get down to the nitty gritty so I don't understand how so many people, mainly women, get diagnosed with it when they so clearly do not have it. Failure to maintain relationships and unstable mood is not just a BPD thing, and fails to capture how dramatic those symptoms manifest in BPD. The oversaturation of BPD has changed the whole definition of BPD to most people, boiling it down to quiet and dependent guilt-ridden empaths desisted female that's why I identified as trans. I was sexualized by peers and adult men. I hated being made to feel like my body was more theirs than mine. I felt like my developing body was a target that became harder to conceal every day. I looked around and women were sexy, stupid, objects, bitches, sluts and prudes. I wasn't any of that. I was just a person. A normal, intelligent, empathetic person. But it felt like my experiences, feelings, and ideas were immediately written off as irrelevant cause I was a woman. But I wasn't one. Cause I was thought being a woman meant emotional and irrational, and a little incapable. And I wasn't that. Eventually it was easier to escape womanhood than to redefine it for all women. Desisted female yes I agree with you. Being a typical woman is harder in matters of having to wear makeup look pretty etc, and also makes you more vulnerable to sexual harassment, so I think many girls experience temporary dysphoria. I hated my breasts, punched them trying to make them disappear. There wasn't transition back then for teens and I'm now glad for it, as my reason for wanting to be a boy was mainly fear of being sexually abused as a girl. Also, puberty made my body change and I felt like I wasn't myself anymore. Took some years to get used to the new body, and I'm happy with it now. This video's last post, titled, Another Vent About How I've Ruined My Life D-Trans Male, continuation from last video's post. The drug I have been taking to reduce my breast tissue is now causing me cognitive impairment. Turns out it's toxic to brain cells. Is it too much to ask that a doctor inform me about these things? Brain fog has been lasting for three days now since quitting it. I'm not sure what the long-term effects will be. At this point I'm just at the end of my rope. I feel that I have permanently ruined my body and now possibly my mind. I was fine just four months ago. I had lived my life healthy and essentially drug free. Didn't even drink. Never smoked. How could I have chosen to do this to myself back then? I was so brainwashed. None of this was safe. What was I thinking? I tried this drug treatment because I had some hope that with reduced breast tissue the nerve sensitivity in my right nipple might normalize but I'm more and more beginning to believe that the doctor was right about it being nerve damage that causes the pain there. The only good thing that came out of this drug was that it did make me look more normal. The breast tissue appears to be mostly gone. My chest will never really be the same, but it isn't as bad. The nipples stick out in a way they didn't before, but it's acceptable, I guess. If appearance was my only problem I'd be moving on already. From the comments. Socially trans, Regrets medical transition do you mind sharing what the drug was? Original poster tamoxifen. Detrans so, 
What's going on with your nipple? Asking as a female who experienced very uncomfortable nipple pain throughout puberty and into my early 20s. Original poster for some reason the right nipple became so sensitive to light touch that it is painful for anything to touch it unless it's a heavy pressure, which it doesn't mind as much. Basically wearing a shirt hurts. One of my two doctors is very sure that it grew so quickly that the nerves couldn't keep up and the pain is due to the nerves being damaged. He says it could get better in a couple years, but he's not sure. Apparently they call this tactile allodynia and sometimes it happens to women after breast surgery because the nerves can be damaged by that too. Detrans okay. Is the pain sharp, stinging slash stabbing, in the nipple itself, or burning like the area has been burned or skinned? I had both in my nipples all the time as a teen, and while I wasn't concerned about it, I don't think I met other people who had the issue. For example, wearing a shirt would hurt the nipples because it felt like sandpaper, or sometimes there just be a repeating stabbing pain in one that didn't go away, touching it would hurt, pinching it hurt a lot, etc. I also had very rapid breast growth through that period. If it's like that, I'm almost certain it'll go away with time. When your tissue stabilizes and the area stops changing, one way or the other, it matures and settles, and for me, the pain over time stopped happening entirely. I'll still get the odd stabbing sensation at 31, but it's so rare I couldn't tell you when it last happened, aside from it being this year, sometime, could have been whenever. You most likely don't need medication or surgery to fix this problem. It 99% likely won't be forever. Dash original poster it's more the sandpaper feeling than stabbing pain, but yes this is pretty much what it's like. It's not burning, more like it's raw. The skinned analogy might be closest. It's not sharp but it does feel like it's in the nipple itself, almost like pressure or pinching. I can sometimes feel that even when I have nothing touching it. You are awesome for sharing this with me. What you described is so close to what I'm experiencing and hearing your story of improvement is very encouraging. I can't express how much I appreciate it. Thank you. Detrans of course. Reading over your story I immediately thought it might be something similar, and because honestly I've never read about it anywhere, I wanted to give you some reassurance it's probably not just a terrible consequence of medical transition but rather something that can happen when you're growing tissue there, and you'll be okay. As per the effects of your medication, it's a cancer drug, and they're all pretty toxic to your body from what I understand. But you can heal from it, your body's really good at healing, so give it time and be forgiving with yourself with the mind fog. Your brain's taken a beating, it slowed down because it's repairing damage, you'll pick up over time from there again. Brains are great at making new connections, learning new ways to work around damage that happens over time. You'll recover. Hang in there. End.